Okay. <laughs> I just wanna. So Frank and John, uh, you guys are part of the uh, Oscar nominated sound team for the film First Man. Uh, specifically, you were the uh, sound mixers on this film, uh, part of the nominated sound mixers. Um, tell us a little bit about what the directives from Damien Chazelle were in terms of what he wanted uh, sound-wise for this film. The, uh, you know, the first thing I would say is that uh, it was, we were pretty lucky because he was, um, we work at Universal all the time. And he and uh, Tom Cross many days would eat lunch right next to the Hitchcock Theater where we work. And so as we, after watching the film, you know, and Frankie and I were thinking about it and coming up with our own ideas. Uh, the one thing that, that was, that was definite and prominent in his mind was to make sure that the sound stuck with the, um, with the way the picture was shot in sort of a very documentary style. So it's kind of was, you know, making sure that it, it just had a reality to it at all times, you know, unless until we didn't want a reality to it. And then that way we take advantage of the dynamics in, in that sense. Um, so, I mean, just I, I guess uh, walk us through a bit how because there's always um, for the layman who doesn't understand uh, the difference between sound editing and sound mixing. Specifically, you guys are re-recording mixers. Tell us a little bit about what that job actually entails. Uh, sure, uh, at least my interpretation of it would be it's the it's where the audio focus ultimately lands um, of what you're hearing versus what you're seeing. So it's a it's a fifty fifty stimuli uh, film. It's fifty fifty. It's you know the the the, the eyes and the ears work in conjunction. Um, so we are constantly trying to keep the audio focus as the picture states, as well as the director, uh, picture editor's opinions on on where that focus may land. We always want to make sure we kind of mix our demographics, meaning when we're working on a picture that is for a younger audience, we stay away from nails on the chalkboard. Let's say yeah. scary, you know, high pressure levels, etc. When working on a you know, 18 to 35 year old demographic, for instance, of Fast and the Furious, it's a lot of fun, it's elevated, it's a big, big sound. And then uh, when we work on a film that's made for a mature audience demographic, we wanna make sure that stories, uh, you know, front and center and foremost, that you never fall out of the story by not hearing the dialogue correctly or getting the emotional, the emotional content from the sounds itself. So we're constantly shaping and, and trying things and moving things in the array uh, through the room, uh, altering the frequencies and the clarity and making those decisions um, sometimes on our own. And, but most of the time we're, we're following a, a direction. Right. In like a, a really uh, a kind of specific example um, in this case would be, because Frankie and I don't have we're not biased. We weren't cutting the effects for the last several months, or we weren't writing the music for the last several months, or we weren't cutting the dialogue for the last several months. So in a way you could say, we're not really married to anything. We're, we're married to what works best for the film emotionally, what's selling the story. And I think a perfect example in this case would be um, the uh, Gemini liftoff where he, obviously hearing uh Ryan Gosling's dialogue is important, but knowing what he says wasn't important. The most important thing was just hearing that he was calm. So the effects, it was all about the effects in that scene, but hearing the calmness in his voice was very uh, important because it lets you know just what type of a person he was and it sold that part of it. And those, and, and getting that sort of balance is definitely what we do as re-recording mixers. Just kind of going off of that, I mean, one of the things that this movie does really well is, you know, put you right there and and make you kind of understand and experience um, just how dangerous these missions were. Can you touch, talk a little bit about, um, through your sound work, how you were able to, to help achieve that? Um, well, the, the film was unique in the sense that there there's three event um well, four events with the X-15 that starts off. But as far as the, the U.S. space program component of the movie, um, we we're at least had the latitude of making those moments, like JT was saying, making those moments really about the how claustrophobic, how dangerous, and how emotional 
um, those moments will were some longer than than others um, and and that's kind of true to script the real life US space program 1960s um, the unknown so it was kind of fun to be able to Eileen did a great job in, in creating the soundscape uh, it's just to keep the keep the energy alive as much as possible and then Damien had the concept in, in most of those moments to have a button ending where sound pressure gets up and so emotionally loud and then drops off a cliff so that dynamic range really kind of gives you a shock to your system as a, as a first time viewer in the audience and then it could a start again or we could get into dialogue and move forward so each of the moments from from the x-15 to the gemini program and into apollo they all had a little different flavor uh, so that was kind of nice where apollo was a marriage at least in the liftoff was a marriage marriage of the saturn V liftoff and the mu and a beautiful piece of music all the way to the first stage release and then we went silent again and settled into the capsule so it was a lot of we had a, a lot of latitude to really kind of build it hold it and then get out of it mm -hmm. Were you guys looking to, I guess, specific things like be it documentaries or, or other films that kind of gave you an idea of like which way to go for this? Or, I mean, did you do some kind of research to, to figure that out? Uh, well, <laughs> he'll, he'll speak in a second because he's, he's, he's lived it. But, uh, you know, um, when, when Frank and I watch the movie, which is almost when it's, you know, uh, done with the edit, you know, very close to when it's done with the edit, we get a chance, we go watch the movie and we sort of, in a way, soak it in, soak it in and to see what it deserves and, uh, or see what type of, type of really mix that it, that it needs. In this case, um, the way that they shot it, the Linus, the, uh, DP, the way he shot it, it was pretty apparent what, that it was a documentary style, almost a, as if, and I'm sure you have, uh, you know, a high eight camera mm -hmm. and you just, you don't hold steady. You don't hold those cameras <laughs> steady. They have a lot of movement to it. And that's the sense that when we watch this, that's the sense um, that we had from this. So, you know, even though you, we have beautiful music, obviously, and, and amazing uh, textures and backgrounds and effects and, you know, the dialogue, but we kind of uh, wanted you know, an another thing that we want to do is just make the film as, as dynamic as possible in every sense. So even uh, pictorially and orally wanted it to be dynamic. So just knowing that we had to keep it documentary style, meaning, you know, kind of close and up front until those moments like, you know, the X-15 and the, the Gemini 8 and the Apollo uh, came up because those were obviously blown out, but it gave us that more contrast and more dynamics, which is really plays in the film. Um, but uh, also, I started in documentary, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you had that. Frank, I had that. Carry forward, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, we had a lot of fun uh, really kind of working with some of the authentic um, um, pieces and, and gear. Um, it took about a year to collect. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with museums and NASA and and the Air Force and whatnot, and, and we had access to a lot of pieces that had never been done before. Um, so it was, it was really unique. We got to work with the original suit manufacturer and uh, ILC Dover in uh, Frederica, Delaware. Uh, we worked in Huntsville, Alabama, where the Saturn V rocket was developed by Von Braun and his team. Uh, we worked in Kansas. We worked out here on Edwards Air Force Base and some private sector collectors have some amazing artifacts that we're able to get things from. For instance, uh, we worked with John Young's bubble helmet, Apollo 10 flown bubble helmet. So he's no longer with us. Uh, so it's great when Ryan Gosling is putting on his in the in the clean room and gearing up and they lock the helmet in place. That's actually John Young's helmet. Um, working with Gene Cernan, Apollo 17, uh, he's no longer with us. And we got to use some of his beta cloth, which is a very rare piece. It's the white layer of the suit. It has a very unique sound. Um, we made lunar boots, didn't make the film, but we made some lunar boots with the proper silicone. We work with NASA Ames. They have, uh, a, a, what's it called? It's called the lunar, it's a lunar soil, uh, the closest thing we have 
um, on Earth that they use. It's a regolith simulant. And uh, we went up and actually did Foley with the proper silicone and proper materials and, and whatnot. So it, from buttons and switches, we were in, um, we were able to take some plexiglass off a simulator, a lunar landing simulator that all astronauts used. And it was kind of thrilled to be inside that space and switches and sticks and whatnot. So that's all uh, throughout the movie. And uh, the surreal deal, Joe Walker's space, uh, his uh, flight suit for the X-15 is highlighted in a couple areas. And it's really, really neat to pay uh, the, uh, the airflow in the Apollo suits were also recorded. And that's in the movie throughout interwoven with production air. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that kind of pays homage to the, the astronauts and the people in the program all those years ago. That's the real deal. Frankie's been a NASA enthusiast since he was a, a, a child. So when he's saying we, that <laughs> it really was Frankie doing this, but it, through the movie, through the film and through Universal. Uh, so not just a rogue person going to do this, but he made all these connections on his own, um, on his uh, on his own time. So it was uh, it was really neat. He would send the sounds back. You know, he would go, he and Alex Knickerbocker, uh, who works works here here at Universal, also would go to uh, Dover and uh, record. You know switches and panels and whatever and getting the authentic real stuff and then he would send the recordings back so we could hear it on the stage and just to make sure that you know it was uh, correct or whatever but he did that all those places it was pretty uh pretty amazing it was a lot of fun. yeah you know, we built uh um a helmet box I went back to kind of like the an analog days so we brought in a a high altitude helmet and a bubble helmet and they were mic'd up and isolated so JT could process the, each mission separately. So the high altitude is, uh, you know, the X-15 and the Gemini program and the bubble was specifically for Apollo. So what you're hearing, that dialogue process um, was actually ran through hardware. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, um, all those little things that you're talking about, um, I think when most people think of sound, they think of crashes and explosions and all those things. but you know, all those little things that you, all those little details and, and steps that you guys took in order to, you know, give this movie an extra sense of authenticity, an extra, you know, sense of something special. Um, can you just talk about, I mean, what does that, what does do all those little things help add to a movie like this? Why is it important to get those things? Well, well, for me, I, I, I remember um, reading an article on, on Saving Private Ryan how some of the vets, when they sat down and watched it, in, in some cases was too real or not real enough, but, mm -hmm. but it, it put them back to that space and time. Um, and in this case, uh, being an enthusiast since I was eight years old, um, I just had a kinship to, to the program and um, I get motion sick, so I couldn't make the astronaut program. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, so for me, it was kind of that that motivation to um, really, at the end of the day, uh, have the remaining members that are still with us sit down, watch a film, and say that's exactly so. That's exactly right. I remember that. That's the way it felt. Uh, obviously, Damon Damien did a fantastic job catch, capturing it and and putting us there. Um, and the detail work from even mission control switches and knobs to, you know, the disky when they're landing on the lunar surface and punching in coordinates and all that stuff is, is a real deal. And there's, and we always had a saying, there's only one thing that sounds like beta cloth and that would be beta cloth. So, so True. we wanted them to, to even the littlest detail, as you say, bring them back to that time and place. You guys are both uh, multiple Oscar nominees uh, for your work on, on various films. What does that uh, recognition mean for you? Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, since we haven't won yet, it's a hard comparison, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, it's uh, being nominated by your peers. I mean, everybody will tell you that, but when you're nominated by your peers, uh, it really says everything. And it, it's, um, I don't know. It just it it seems very nice, you know. When it goes to the academy, it's everybody has you know their own reasons or whatever. You never know why. I feel very happy for uh, you know the winners. But to be honest with you, for me, the times that I've lost, it didn't. 
I was fine. You know, I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> I didn't feel like I lost anything. I mean, it, I was very happy, uh, you know, when, uh, when Mad Max went over Revan, I was really happy for those mixers. And, uh, I, you know, so I got to think that being nominated, uh, uh, which I've always felt good about. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, it, uh, it's, it's a great feeling for sure. It's a great feeling for sure. And, and for me personally, um, what I take from it, I, I think the, the proudest thing for me is this is my ninth trip. Um, I got a great mixing partner I adore. Um, it is, I've been part of five different crews that have been nominated. So that's, that's some, the specialist part for me anyway. That's like, you know, just the, the human connection of the craftsmanship and, and sitting there and working side by side together and getting recognized by your peer group is, is amazing. Um, win, lose or draw, it's a great feeling. And, and if mm -hmm. you don't let it define yeah. you, yeah, then, then not winning that night it's just another day. Yeah, in fact, who said that? Someone said. I think it. I just. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who said, uh, said, now that you would, how do you feel now that you won the Oscar? He goes, well, I still got to take the trash out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the Oscar at hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentlemen, thank you both so much. Congratulations on the film and, and on your nomination. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you so much, Zach. Thank appreciate you very much. Bye-bye.